All right, welcome to our third, our, actually tonight's Wednesday, Wednesday night, New York Giants Preservation Society meeting uh, with Paul Kosak. Uh, we usually meet on Thursdays, but uh, Paul was available today. And I'm very happy Paul's not really fully 100% uh, in health and he uh, soldiers on tonight with us. So uh, just for some uh, news of what's going to be going on in the future. Uh, there'll be no meeting next week. We will reconvene on August 4th with um, Tom Flynn. Tom is going to be talking about his great, great uncle, Tom Sheehan, who was a longtime uh, scout with the Giants, turned out to be their manager, worked for the New York Giants and the San Francisco Giants. Um, after that, we have Kurt Smith on the 11th. Um, Kurt did the whole New York Giant broadcasters. Now he's going to turn his attention to the San Francisco broadcasters from 1958 till the present day crew that we have. Uh, after that, it's going to be play by ear. My daughter's expecting um, a new son in the middle of August. So I will try my best to schedule something uh, around that. So it's the 18th and 25th. It'll be one of those days we'll have a meeting, I hope. So we will go from there. Uh, but for now, uh, Paul is going to be talking about his book. It's called Chasing Willie Mays. Paul spoke at a live meeting uh, years ago at Bergino Baseball Clubhouse. But our uh, reverence for Willie Mays never ends. And I thought it'd be appropriate for Paul to talk about this book uh, today to the new group, which Basically, we are now on Zoom. Uh, this is not your biography on Willie Mays book that, uh, you know, we had John Shea and uh, uh, Jim Hirsch talk about. <clears throat> this is a fan's perspective on Willie Mays. And for that, I am going, I'm proud to turn over the screen to Paul Kosak. Paul, welcome to our meeting tonight. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Gary, for that uh, great introduction. And also thank you for uh, switching to a Wednesday because I have a uh, standing commitment on uh, Thursdays. So, um, you know, it's almost intimidating to listen to all you folks because I surely am not uh, as expert on Willie Mays or the Giants uh, in New York or San Francisco as uh, a lot of you folks. Um, but as Gary said, my book uh, really, my book is really kind of telling my growing up story through through the lens of baseball, and um, you know, like probably most people here, probably everyone here, um, Willie Mays uh, captivated me, and I was born in 1948. I'm 73, and um, before I read from my book, I'll just tell you. Uh, how I became a Giants fan. My brother Richard was a little bit older than me. He's going off to the Air Force in 1955. Maybe it was even the winter of 54, 55. Because if, if I watched the Giants in the World Series in 1954, I have no memory of it. Uh, maybe you could hypnotize me and I could relive it, but I, I don't have any memory of it. So even though it happened in my lifetime, it, it, it's like it, as if it didn't. So my brother was going away and something came up, I don't know. And I said, I, I said to him, uh, who do you like? And um, he said, Willie Mays, the Giants. And I learned later that he had switched from being a Yankees fan to a Giants fan. And he, he's not alive now, so I never got to query him, but it, pretty much had to be because of Willie Mays. And so here I was a little kid and I, I was captivated. You know, we played baseball in the backyard, kids in the neighborhood. Um, you know, I don't know if you folks did this. Uh, you know, they would say, well, who, you, who are you gonna be? You know, I, I was an outfielder. I had a good arm, I couldn't catch it, but I had a good arm, I could run after and catch the ball. And I'd say, I'm going to be, you know, number 24, Willie Mays. And sometimes there would be a, um, a racial epithet. Some, you know, they would, they would say, you know what he is? I, I said, yeah, I don't care. 
And, and this book doesn't delve into that very much, but I, I need to note it because Willie Mays did influence my views on, on race. And I know he doesn't like to talk about it much, but it, it did shape my, uh, how I looked at the world. It really did. So I'm gonna read, oh, before I read from the book, um, I, is Bob Costas in on this, Gary? Because I'm gonna call him out. So I sent the, my book to Bob Costas. Oh, I think it was, it was before the pandemic. And it was weird because I, looked, I went on the internet, you know, you can find just about anything. And I found an address for him listed in St. Louis or Clayton, Missouri, suite 605 or something. And I said, that, that doesn't sound right. But I put the book in an envelope and sent it to him. I, I never heard anything. And then about a month ago, I get this postcard of Mickey Mantle, Mickey Mantle's plaque uh, at Cooperstown and handwritten, Costas writes, Paul, I know you are a Mays guy and I love him too, but as a kid, Mickey was my guy. Thanks for sending your fans memoir. But what is the glove doing on Willie's right hand? Quest three question marks, Bob Costas. All right, let's get this taken care of. There's the cover. The glove is on the right hand. It's me. I'm left-handed. I'm chasing Willie Mays. <laughs> and I don't recall Willie Mays ever wearing a hat backwards. And I look kind of white there. So anyway, my son did this cover. He did the artwork. Ethan Kosak also uses the name Black Mud Puppy. He did a great job. So I, I sent a postcard to... Um, to Costas saying that a postcard with a scene from uh, Syracuse. I'm calling from Syracuse, New York tonight. And I said, thank you, Mr. Costas. I never know in a case like that, whether it should be Mr. Costas or Bob, right? I said, uh, thank you, Mr. You know, for the handwritten postcard, appreciate that. But, uh, and then I just told him, you know, it's not a mistake. It's, it's supposed to be me and I'm left-handed. However, I added, it's sort of like if you're a stand-up comedian and you have to explain a joke, you know? So I guess he has a point. I've heard a couple of other people say the same thing. And, um, you know, if you have to explain a joke, it kind of ruins the punchline. So I'll agree to that. So that's my little opening. I'm gonna um, read a couple of selections from the book, which is available on Amazon, also from the publisher, creators, uh, creatorspublishing.com or creators.com. They're out a small publishing house in uh, Hermosa Beach, California. You know, when I got an email, I, I, I had submitted this book to a number of places. I even had an agent, uh, uh, Jim Fitzgerald, who came up with the title. And so it didn't get picked up, but I, I wanted to get the book out there. And I got an email and a call from um, Simone Slykhouse at, at um, Creators Publishing. They do a lot of syndicated stuff. And um, she said, we, we love your book. We want to publish it. And I mean, honestly, I thought it was a hoax, you know, some kind of thing to get some money out of me. But um, they did that. Uh, so that was, that was fun. And uh, I'm not crazy about some of the typographical things things that they did, but I had no control over that. And um, I just ordered some more books from them today. No, they don't give them free. They don't, they don't give them out free. All right, I'm gonna read you the opening of the book. And uh, bear with me. I missed Willie, I was nine years old. I needed to talk to Willie Mays, my hero, to see how he was adjusting, see how things were going. The New York Giants had abandoned me, moving to San Francisco. Willie had no choice in the matter. He had to go along with his teammates. I'm sure he liked New York just fine and would have stayed if he could. I missed seeing Willie on television, tapping his glove and then sprinting after fly balls in the polo grounds, center field and beyond. 
into parts of left field or right field with the ball landing securely into Mays' web leather basket. No more could I watch Willie Mays as he ran out from under his cap, rounding the bases, sliding home, safe, number 24. And of course, I missed his dug-in stance, strong hands curled around his Adirondack bat and his swing almost ending up one-handed and still knocking the ball into the seats. I missed all that and more. The more was the most important part of all. An elan, a daring, an abandon no kid could describe or needed to describe. I wanted Mays to know we had not forgotten him back east. At least one young fan in the William C. Ward homes in Stamford, Connecticut had not forgotten him. When in New York, Mays had found, had a home in Riverdale in the Bronx, it wasn't all that far from Stanford. I daydreamed wondering what it would be like to talk or meet Willie Howard Mays Jr. You did not just pick up the phone and dial San Francisco. You had to talk to the long distance operator. So when my parents went shopping on Thursdays after my father came home from work, I knew this was a perfect time uh, to try and call reach Willie, especially if my older brother Jack and our baby brother Bobby went with them. It allowed for stealth and the time difference was good, unless Willie was at work playing an afternoon game. So I reached the long distance uh, information operator. Do you have a number please for Willie Mays? What city, sir? San Francisco in California. One moment, please. Do your parents know you are doing this? I'd lie, which was not easy. I was not, and I'm not a talented liar. Uh, and I would report such a lie in confession at St. Benedict's Church on the following Saturday afternoon. My hands were shaking. My voice was shaking. What if they charged us merely to check with information? I had done research on this and was pretty sure they did not. <clears throat> but before this, this was all that, and the information operator said, that number is unlisted, sir. So I never did get a hold of Willie Mays. And, you know, thinking about this when I was writing the book, I don't know what I would have said to him. I mean, it's kind of a lunatic thing for a nine-year-old kid to think he's going to talk to Willie Mays. Um, and... My mother died at the age of 102, um, uh, two years ago, almost three. And um, I asked her, I said, you know, was there anything on the phone bill? <laughs> there wasn't. So, it, I mean, for all these decades and decades and decades, uh, my parents or anybody else, I don't think they knew that I had uh, tried to call San Francisco. And I, I mean, I was a nervous wreck, but I was determined. Um, it, it didn't happen. So, read a little more. I should add that I enjoyed baseball. I, uh, I played it, but I was not very good at it. Um, I played, I didn't even make it to Little League. We had a pre-Little League, uh, you know, team in Stanford, Connecticut, where Bobby Valentine is from, as everyone from Stanford would remind you. And um, I wasn't, I wasn't very good. I, I, um, I what do they call it? I always put my foot in the bucket because I was afraid the pitcher was going to hit me. And uh, again, I was fast. I had a good arm. And I played the outfield, you know, making believe I was Willie Mays. My arm was so good, they put me on the pitcher's mound. But no, no one knew how to, you know, no one taught me how to pitch. The other team, the other team sitting on the bench would chant, two, four, six, eight, who do we appreciate? The pitcher. Because I was walking runs in. It was kind of cruel that they kept me on the mound. Um, so... Uh, Hold on. One day, 
in the 50s, my mother and I walked down the aisle of the Woodworths store on Atlantic Street. There was nowhere else to shop. Everyone came downtown. No malls, no suburban office parks, just downtown. I wanted a scrapbook. I do not know where that notion came from. There was no popular craze with special accoutrements and equipment, cutouts, stick-ons, scissors, all that stuff. There were no circles of scrapbooking friends. The word scrapbooking did not exist, but I wanted a scrapbook for the giants. My father and my brother Jack wander along parallel aisles of the linoleum floors or the wood floor section over by the parakeets. Now, when I was in a store, my father's retail mantra was, keep your hands off that or you're going to break it. He had a pronounced fear of store item breakage rooted in his depression era poverty. The counters had removable glass walls, five or six inches high, which some 15 years later, I would take down and reconfigure when I worked at that Woolworths. The scrapbooks were in the photo album section. Incidentally, our family did not archive photos in those albums in those days. So we did get a scrapbook. I still have it in a, in a, um, in, a, in, a in, you know, back in a storage room. It's kind of falling apart, but it, uh, <laughs> it's funny. I would, I would, uh, remember who's the guy, Mullen, uh, who did the cartoons for the Daily News, Wilford Mullen, Mullen right? Oh, I tried to imitate his style and I put that in my, my scrapbook. In fact, I believe the Giants yearbook, at least one of those years had, was done by him, right? Okay. So, um, I and I would take the playing cards that we all collected and I would, wait for it, I would paste them into my scrapbook. And um, nobody that I knew had any clue that these things were going to be valuable collector's items. I think my earliest Willie Mays card was in 1955 and uh, I pasted it into my scrapbook. Uh, when I was older, you know, years later, I, I went to one of those uh, collectible places and uh, I showed up my card. It had some damage. I tried to clean up you know, the glue, and, and um, the, they almost laughed me out of the store. I was offended. You know, I really didn't want to sell it anyway. Um, but um, I, I was just offended that they, they were like mocking me that, you know, why did you glue it in the scrapbook? But it came out of a whole different universe. Uh, I have a friend here who's, who's uh, on this call, on this Zoom, and uh, He's a, he's a collector of baseball cards and he has given me some Willie Mays cards. So I still collect them every now and then. But no, but no, but I wouldn't sell anything in that scrapbook. Oh, I have, I have a uh, cutout from the newspaper. I heard you folks talking about so many parts of the early days. I have a cutout from the, uh, AP story with the Giants last game in September of 1957. And I, you know, I don't have the scrapbook here, but I think there were only something like 11,000 people at that game. And it was on probably channel, somebody will help me out here, channel 11 or nine. Um, all right, someone will correct me on that. And there was there were fans standing by the clubhouse in the uh, in the outfield, standing uh, uh, chanting "Stay Giants, Stay." And I mean, I was in tears. I mean, I really was in tears. I didn't know what I was going to do. So, like many of you, I, I suspect uh, they moved, and uh, I stuck with them. I know um, other people who wouldn't. You know, um, I, I I've read where. Uh, Pete Hamill, who was a Dodgers fan uh, growing up in Brooklyn, he, he didn't pay attention to baseball at all in any way for at least 10 years after the Dodgers left. And, uh, but that wasn't the case for me. I don't know what would have happened if they had moved to Tampa or Toronto. That just, that would be an existential crisis, but uh, it did not happen. So 
I'm sure you folks have some stories on that too. I talk a little bit about uh, Les Kiter on WINS 1010. He, uh, he, he did the uh, recreations of the games and being a kind of a naive kid, it took me a long time to realize that that was just a recreation. They were just sound effects. I saw a story in Sports Illustrated and learned that I was not really listening uh, to the game. But uh, I mean, I, I really, I carried a transistor radio and I, I listened to that and it was, it, it, it was great. I also detail in the book, uh, when, uh, and I know people are gonna remember this because I was in Cooperstown selling books and people told me who the men were on base Giants were losing 11 to one to the Pirates in 1958. They were playing at Seal Stadium and um, Giants scored nine runs in the ninth inning. So now it's 11 to 10 and there are a couple guys on base and a guy named Don Tossig made the last out, T-A-U-S-S-I-G. And I called him up when I was writing this book, he lives in uh, Jupiter, Florida. And, you know, I feel a little bad about it because he said, everybody remembers it. He said he would go to sports dinners and people would bring it up. And I mean, at the time he said they were making death threats practically. Anybody remembered it that, that, that you know, two other guys had to make it out, but he had the last out and, and Giants lost that game 11 to 10 nine runs were scored in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the ninth inning by the Giants. And uh, Don Tossig was, if he wasn't born in New York City, he was born on Long Island. He was, he was a local guy and that's, there weren't too many playing baseball then. He eventually wrote a book about uh, hitting and he said that, and he, he had a bunch of uh, squash clubs that he ran. Uh, for all I know, he still does. He, he was very gracious, but I really kind of felt bad bringing it up, if you want to know the truth. And he said, the good hitters, the good hitters in those days, he said they were, uh, they were farm boys. They had strong wrists and forearms because, because of all the hard work they, they did uh, on the farm. And he developed a whole theory of hitting um, that I believe is still, still available, still being sold. Um, you've, you've heard me mention a couple of references to my uh, Catholic upbringing. Uh, in high school, I was in the seminary studying to be a priest, but uh, I did not become a priest. Um, I've been married and divorced twice, so it shows you how that worked out. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to describe what it was like when, the, well, it had to be 1958, because I think Les Kider was only on for one year. Not positive of that. But we would be listening to Giants games on WINS, and my friend Kenny Viola, uh, he would call up. And he, uh, if the Giants were losing, let's say, three to one in the bottom of the ninth with two on and two outs, Kenny Viola would call, and our conversation would go something like this. You listening? Of course. We need to at least tie. I know, Maze is on deck. Do you have the beads out? No, wait a second. Come on, hurry. Get them out. Okay, okay. Now, how's it go? What do you mean? How do you do the rosary? And I'd explain how a decade was prayed. An Our Father, followed by 10 Hail Marys, followed by a Glory Be. We'd hang up, too nervous or afraid to talk, fearful of jinxing the giants or breaking a spell. And St. Joseph's Sunday Missal provided heavy, spiritual ammunition. The Hail Holy Queen, a long severe prayer recited after mass was an arcane arrow in our arsenal. And I would not have been surprised in the least to have resorted to a novena, a nine day prayer, if the occasion suited for it. The Giants were playing crucial series against the Braves then, who were formidable opponents. One could only assume the petitions to St. Jude patron saint of lost causes 
would arise from my lips and rise like incense to the baseball gods. And, uh, you know, it's a bit of superstition, but man, uh, you know, I would pray with all my might that the Giants would win a game. And uh, this kid, Ken Viola, conspired with me. And, uh, you know, I don't think, I probably hear some stories on this. I don't think I was all that different from a lot of other people growing up at that time, that age and at that place. Um, I'm going to tell one more story than just read the very uh, end or tell two stories without reading. Uh, in the course of writing this book, um, I, uh, I recounted uh, the loss of a friend who drowned. Uh, his name was Mike Palo. And uh, in our neighborhood, it was, a, it was a housing project in Stanford, and um, it was in Greenwich. <laughs> and uh, we really did that Willie Mays, Mickey Mantle, Duke Schneider thing. You know, we would argue who was, who was better, who was the best. And so my brother Jack was a Mickey Mantle guy. Mike Pela was a, um, was a uh, Duke Schneider guy, and I was Willie Mays. And, you know, thing, it was friendly. There was no bitterness, like, you know, the way people talk about the Giants and Dodgers or the Red Sox and Yankees. There was nothing bitter about it. We were just kids. We might taunt each other, but there was no, nothing bitter about it. So uh, Mike was uh, a Dodgers fan. He, uh, he became very close to me, um, and he, he drowned in he, uh, 1964. And um, it, I, I only did limited research on this. Uh, Jackie Robinson lived in Stanford in those days. And it, it actually might have been a, uh, a pond uh, or a lake on Jackie Robinson's property. Uh, later on, I figured uh, Mike Palo, my friend, was very, very tall and gangly. And I have concluded that he, um, he had Marfan syndrome because he, he would have seizures and pass out. But the whole reason I'm telling you the story, and not, not to be a downer or anything, when I, when I was writing this book, um, I related this story. I, it, had, it had to be in the book. And I'll tell you, you know, people talk about grief and they say, uh, they use the word closure. When I was writing this book, the whole drowning from 1964 came back to me uh, uh, as if it happened the day before. Uh, it, was, it was extremely uh, palpable. Um, it, it was it was still there, you know, and I, it actually kind of ambushed me. And I realized, um, you know, that that affected me my whole life. Um, I'm going to conclude with something related to this organization. Um, so in the beginning of 20. So after the Giants won the series in 2014, the following January, I think Gary will correct me, uh, Willie Mays was in town uh, and they had the trophy at the, um, the hotel, which actually was the old uh, Villard house in New York. And I used to work at Random House and I don't know if you folks know it, the Random House that they originally drew in the logo was that building, the old original Villard house over by Madison and 50th, maybe 49th. So um, uh, because of uh, Gary's intercession and everybody here, my friend uh, Dennis uh, Zucchino and I, we drove, uh, I stayed in Warwick and we drove down uh, to that uh, great time when Willie Mays was, was there recounting his stories. He has such a great uh, memory. And, you know, there was a question and answer time uh, after May spoke. And I was thinking of raising my hand. Honest to God, I didn't know what I was going to say. You know, I was kind of a little kid again. Why did, why did you leave? And clearly in my mind, Willie never left New York. At that, at that event, he really, he loves being in New York and he loved being there. He, it, it's like, I, he might have used those words. He, in, in, in many ways, he never left New York. So um, 
Willie was um, over standing by the uh, elevators with uh, the folks from uh, Finnerty's. Maybe Gary Mintz was standing there. So w Willie Mays was standing right near me. He had just regaled the Hall of the Faithful with great stories of palpable joy and warmth. He seemed to be retreating into a place of his own inner reserve. I felt I could not trespass into that sacred realm. I had no right to do so, no permission and no desire. Being speechless after chasing Willie Mays all these years was more than acceptable, even for talkative me. Being speechless was just right. Seeing and hearing my hero in the flesh, listening to his stories as if we were his neighbors or his kin on the porch on a summer evening, that was fine. A perfect snapshot of a perfect ending. And that's how I ended the book. Uh, because I, I, I didn't really want to, he was Willie Mays, I wanted to leave him alone. Um, so I'm gonna end on this though, because it kind of contradicts everything I said. Uh, when, the, when the book came out in 2016, a member of this group said, you know, I have, um, I have Willie Mays' number. Why don't, why don't you call him up, tell him about the book. And oh, oh, it's you. Is that Steve? Steve, yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. So you look like Bill Rigney, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> so Steve said, you know, I have his number. I call him up on his birthday. It's cool. Nice. No, I can't do that. He said, yeah, he he'll either answer or his uh, housekeeper will answer. So about a week went by, and kind of on impulse. I picked up the phone. No, I had a cell phone. I dial it. And, and right away, I know it's Willie Mays. Right away. And uh, he, he says, hi. He says, wait, I have, to, I have to turn the TV down. It was too loud, just like all old people. And uh, <laughs> so he, he said, uh, what, what can I do for you, sir? Here's Willie Mays calling me, sir. Uh, uh, and I said, look, I, ha I have this uh, book out about being a fan, uh, Willie Mays fan, and uh, it's called Chasing Willie Mays. And uh, he said, he said, I, I heard about that. I said, oh, I don't think he did, but okay, maybe he did. And uh, he said, well, what, what, what would you like me to do? I said, I said, uh, how, how do I get the book to you? And he said, uh, send it to the ballpark. I said, okay, which, which I did. Uh, I, I never heard back, but I'm sure he got it. Um, he, uh, he couldn't be more gracious. People have heard uh, stories. Uh, that's my phone in the background, ignore it. And he, he could not have been more gracious. And the reason I tell this story at the end is because, uh, it, you know, the, the book begins with a nine-year-old trying, uh, trying to call Willie Mays. And then... I eventually uh, did call him and it went great. And it didn't necessarily have to go that way. You know, he, 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 he had every right to, to say, uh, don't call here, you have no business doing that, or who are you, you know? Uh, if, if someone called me out of the blue like that, I would probably be more rude. But I just, um, I'm, I'm so grateful. He, he could not have been more generous and grateful, uh, graceful. Um, so it was really a wonderful coda to this, uh, to this whole story. And, uh, oh, it, somebody suggested to me, uh, why don't you offer, you know, he has glaucoma, why don't you offer to come out there and read on your own dime? So I did send a handwritten note to Willie Mays to offer to do that, uh, that offer stands. So thank you very much. Paul, I've read the book, and first of all, thank you for uh, acknowledging our group in the book. That was very, very kind of you, if I haven't told you that already. Um, I know you're uh, an esteemed and accomplished author, but you did something that probably all of us would want to do, is, is write a book about their uh, love relationship with Willie May. so I applaud you for that. 
Uh, we have a lot of uh, questions. Uh, we're going to go with Bill Clank, then Ed, Norm, and Harvey. Bill, you're up. Yeah, I'm mute. Well, first off, thank you very much. And I think you, you lived out a, a boyhood dream for all of us. I think without exception here, all of us, you know, wanted to reach out and touch Willie Mays in some manner. And then, you know, I, I, you were lucky enough, and I'll relate a story I had, but first off, I wanted to offer consolations on the loss of your friend, Mike, uh, and another consolation. I can't imagine what it's like to lose a boyhood friend in boyhood. Um, I didn't. All my friends, we played baseball together. We did things. We graduated from high school and college, and we went out on life. But to have lost one in the way that you did, that's my consolation to you. Um, a consolation, too, on the, the, the way that you were treated. And many of us have been mistreated by people when we go to a baseball card store. Sometimes these people think they're holier than thou. And if you ever do, I hope you still have that card. And if you ever do take it back to a store, you've got to say to them just simply this, this card, okay? I know how you grade things. You refer to them as excellent or mint. And this is a classic card from my youth. And the thing about it is you can say, now look, this card is 70 years old. I'm looking around at a group here of mostly 70 and 80 year old people. How many of them, Paul, are excellent to mint? So why should we expect the baseball cards to be excellent to mint? And if you, <laughs> that baseball card of Willie Mays that may be tattered around the edges, but has meaning to you is a better card than one that's excellent or mint yes, if, that some guy has in a plastic thing that no one the human hands will never touch again not just human hands but willie may's hands and willie may's glove touch that ball now you can't really see it too well but there's a maze autograph of that on may 21st 1963 i convinced my next door neighbor to take the bus up from palo alto to the game on a friday night because my mother wouldn't let me go alone and they weren't taking me. So we went and, you know, it was really cold and there weren't many people in the 90 cent bleachers. But I had this thought, you know, what if Willie catches the final out? And my buddy Greg said, we'll call for the ball. And what do you know? Willie Mays caught the final out in that game against the Pirates. Greg actually said, Hey, Willie, throw me the ball. Well, guess what? Willie did throw the ball. He caught it, threw it, one bounce off the 90 cent bleachers that many of you have been in at Candlestick Park. And it ended up in my hands, not Greg's hands, and went deep into my pocket. And then later at El Camino Park down in uh, Palo Alto, I got him to sign it. Uh, and this ball will never leave my possession and I would ask my wife and children because they don't give a rats whatever about it to put it in my casket with me so Willie can <laughs> that, that, you know this thing you, there's so many Willie Mays baseballs that have been autographed but how many have real provenance and real story and that's it you know yeah, you, you've got those stories and those are the kind of Willie Mays stories that there are I was fortunate in 1983 to get on the field for Willie Mays Day and uh, got pictures of him up close. And this is one where he's actually shaking hands with uh, Leo DeRocher. But getting on the field on Mays Day and taking pictures, I mean, that was the only thing that even came close to getting the Willie Mays caught ball and thrown ball. There are so many stories that all of us have, and you've encapsulated them all. You know, uh, uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you. Thank you for I, I want to read, I, I'm going to get the book and read it because uh, uh, it, I'm sure there are more stories that will remind me and others of, of our youth and our memories of Willie. Thank you. Some are barely printable. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Ed Freer, you're up, Ed. Yeah, Paul, thank you. You can tell yeah. you're a really sensitive person. And, and our backgrounds are so similar. 
including the scrapbook, the first game in 1954, and the memories of the Giants. And at the Palace Hotel, when we were there, when we saw you in the, on the, in the Greenwich Village, I mentioned to you, I was the fellow that had positioned myself just in line. And I think you recall, so that as Willie was exiting, he had to shake my hand. And that was extremely memorable that day. My, my question is, did you ever see, and this is a very simple question, the Leave it to Beaver episode where uh, Beaver calls Don Drysdale? I think I have. Um, no? I know about it. I might have seen it. I know Drysdale was on a couple of shows. Yeah. Well, go ahead. All right. Well, that's the main thing. I just wanted to see if you'd seen that. Uh, and I can see my cable starting to fade out. My my friend Dan Valenti, who did the intro, he he's a, he's a nut about fifties and sixties TV, and he he recounted some of those. Or Chuck Connor on the Rifleman, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but I, I can't recall it. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ed. Mr. World Serious. <laughs> Speak your piece, Norm. Go ahead. Paul, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. Um, we have had so many great speakers um, at these meetings. No one has moved me the way you did today. I just want to thank you for that. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate those, that. For those who don't know, Norm uh, was on and talked about the world serious. And Paul, if you want to spend a minute, you wrote a book called The World Serious. It came out before this book. It, it's about going to San Francisco. You know, I'm, I don't know if I would do it again. I'm older. I, I went out to San Francisco in 2010, 2012, 2014. And in 2012, I went on, I, I, I bought a scalp ticket and I'm standing at an ATM. I pulled out $200 with a stranger standing right next to me. He could have taken all my money. And I got in, went to the, I got a seat in the bleachers for the World Series. Pablo Sandoval hit three home runs. But um, I think you'd all know, you know, there are moments in life when you know you're happy and you're going to always remember this as happiness. And that that's what that was like. I came up with the title. I don't know how, but when they had a trophy uh, thing at uh, Finnerty's, uh, Larry Bear was there and he said, well, that's what we say in our household, World Series. So I, can't, I make no claim on inventing the term. And, and it, the book isn't even that serious. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Norm Harvey. You're up. Paul, uh, I got to tell you my scrapbook story. Uh, I was born in 45, so I was 12 when the Giants decided to play their home games 3,000 miles from me. And I put together a scrapbook. And I had the, the baseball cards. I had the great one of Willie. Uh, I even had one of Bobby Thompson in a Milwaukee Braves uniform. Mm -hmm but Bobby's forever giant. And I put them in my scrapbook with staples. <laughs> so when I, I still have this thing somewhere. And I, 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 quite a while ago, I dug it out for our son and I showed him it. And he said to me very succinctly, dad, staples? <laughs> and I said, who knew? Right. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I got to get your book. Uh, I saw Willie. Uh, I just celebrated. Uh, it was July 10th, 1954. I celebrate that myself every year. It was July 10th, 1954. I saw him live at the polo grounds. He made a great catch in right center field, whirled around, threw a runner out at home plate. He stole home, but the official scorer ruled it a, an error on the pitcher. My father ruled it a steal of home. He was keeping score. And when people ask me, I, I was born in Brooklyn, raised in the Bronx, in the, in, not in the shadow of Yankee Stadium, but in the shadow of thousands of Yankees fans. Mm. Why did I remain a Giants fan over all these decades? My answer is Willie Mays. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for your reminiscences. You're welcome. And maybe coincidental or not, July 10th uh, 
is my late brother's birthday, the one who introduced me to Willie Mays. So who knows, right? Who knows? Paul, one thing. Um, so you write the book, all your whole, your whole life, you're chasing him down. That day in, in January 2015, when it finally happens, is there a really, leap? What's, what's your immediate feeling? You know, you drive... And if you remember that day, it was a snowstorm. I, snowed, was worried, yeah. I was worried about getting there. You get there and you're finally, you know, in the same room with the guy. What's your immediate reaction? Uh, my quick answer is uh, I was conflicted. And by that, I mean, Harry was in the room and you actually had a restricted number of people and you kind of squeezed me and Dennis in there. And uh, so Maze was there and I, you know, I, I'm listening, and this is great. I, I've seen him other times uh, that I mentioned in the book. But um, what, I think reverence is, is the word that comes to mind. And he was telling stories, when, and, and then he had the Q&A. In some ways, I felt like I would be spoiling the party. Uh, it was Willie Mays' turn to talk. And then when he was at the elevator... I really did have a reverence for him. And, uh, you know, sometimes the gods should be left on Mount Olympus. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we're going to go to Mars and then uh, Bill Garrett. Mars? Yes. Uh, thank you, Paul, for joining us. It's been very enjoyable. You're uh, I have some uh, couple of questions and comments. First, uh, Harvey, you must have known the staple singles. That's why you stapled the card. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Second of all, uh, back to Les Kider, uh, and I, some of our members could uh, confirm this or, or straighten me out, but I believe they started on wins recreating the games in 1958 up until the Mets came into being, you know, the, the, no, the other thing is I, I wanted to ask you if, uh, have you heard about I don't know if I'm the original here, but my plight to have the ballpark uh, adding a name of Willie Mays Field and Oracle Park that apparently has gone on deaf ears to Larry Bear uh, because he conceded that there are already so many things named after Willie Mays, like the statue and the plaza. And I've wa I'm wondering if you, you've heard about that and uh, if you could comment on those subjects. I've heard about it, I believe, through this forum or some emails. I think that's the only place I heard about it. I, um, I, I would tend to not want to do it. I, I think uh, Willie Mays' place is well established. And I don't know of any other ballpark named after an actual player. Uh, I, I suppose you could say a ballpark is desecrated by a commercial name, you know, naming rights, but uh, I don't, I don't know. Um, well, just, there's a precedent for that. If so I interrupt, it's Ricky Henderson field at ODOT Co Coliseum. Is it, is so it, we're not actually changing the name. It's still Oracle park, but just that there would be a memento in center field with the 54 series catch that says Willie Mays field. Uh, at Oracle Park. So it's not changing the name. There's also um, Joe Lewis Arena. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm cool with it. And um, yeah, I'm okay with it. So if you can address the other, uh, uh, well, my other comments, please. Well, which one? Well, uh, to uh, let's, let's say for somebody to authenticate how many years Les kind of recreated the games? Because I remember listening at night when I was a, a kid in 58, and I believe 59, and maybe even 1960, or, or, or longer until I, the Mets were born. I heard Les Kider recreate Juan Marischal's first game, and I believe yes. that was 1960. And I listened oh, okay. to it. Um, yeah, okay, I didn't, I didn't know that. I, I know he did it in 58 and then I've had Giants fans like in Cooperstown or maybe here uh, do the commercial jingles for Northwest Airlines or whatever one they used uh, on that show. 
Um, so if if it did go into the time of the Mets, uh, so be it. To me, no, it's, I, I don't it, think it went into the Mets. I think it ended in '60. I really do. Okay. To what me, about '61? The Mets weren't born till '62. Right. I think I don't remember '61, but I remember '60. I remember Juan's. What was it? A one hitter. One yeah, hitter. and McCovey's first game, two triples and two singles. Yeah, I did. I, I remember that with Les Kiber. I do remember that. And what I made a point of it in the book was, um, you know, they didn't do it for the Dodgers. They did no. it for the Giants. <laughs> and I well, mean, Kiber claims, Les Kiber claims that because the Dodgers had more older stars that were fading out and the Giants had all these newcomers, uh, Latin players and black players. So my my credit to Horace Sonam actually is for having about eight uh, uh, other than Caucasian players on the team, which was more than the Dodgers ever feel because the Dodgers had four blacks and the Giants had four Latins and four blacks. Right. All right, let's go to Bill Karen. Bill? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Paul, for sharing your uh, memories of, uh, of Willie Mays growing up. And the first thing I'd like to say is that um, I forget the gentleman's name, but Marischal's first game, he threw a one-hitter against the Phillies. Clay right. Temple hit a double. He pitched a complete game, and it was in 1960. So you yep. are correct on that. Yep. Uh, what I like to say is, you know, a lot has been written and said about Willie Mays, but one of the things that always sticks in my mind is that in August of 1965, there was a game between the Dodgers and the Giants where Marischal hit Roseboro on the head. And I'll never forget, it was Willie Mays who took Roseboro into the dugout, took some towels and wiped some of the blood off until the trainer could treat uh, Roseboro. And it just shows you what a human being Willie Mays was, how he helped someone who was not even his teammate in a time of need. And he helped to stop the fight from getting worse. Well, there, yeah. were, there were several of them because there was about 15, 20 people in the fight there. You know, you had guys like Orlando Cepeda and all that. They were very hot tempered uh, people. But that I always remember about Mays as well as the fact I used to see photographs uh, in the newspaper of Mays playing stickball with the kids in Harlem. Mm -hmm. And then he would go and buy them ice cream. Right. So it shows you what a great human being Willie Mays is besides being such a great ball player. And I think that that means a lot, particularly today where a lot of our players, not all of them, but some of them are very narcissistic and only care about themselves and their own statistics. I agree. But, but thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank we're going to go to uh, Mrs. Mays and then Jacob and Renee. Um, thank you. I don't have too much to say, but I just have a picture of me chasing Willie Mays, hmm. if you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then... Was that a marriage proposal? That was when he proposed to me. Okay. <laughs> Did you say yes? Of course. That's why I'm amazed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Jacob, I assume uh, welcome tonight, Jacob. I assume you're Paul's friend. Floor yes, yours. indeed. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, Paul's Paul's a dear friend of mine. Um, uh, big Mets fan here, although Greg Prince and I both agree that had we uh, had we been born a generation earlier, who's also on this call, we would have been New York Giants fans. They are certainly the spiritual successors to the Mets more so than the Brooklyn Dodgers are, in my perspective. So, Paul, um, having having read your book and uh, thank you for for sharing um, your your memories, I couldn't help but think while you were speaking you're describing an age of baseball fandom that's a little bit um, of an anachronism, right? You're checking box scores in the newspaper. Um, you don't have the, the privilege of the internet, right? You can't even stream your, your Giants games live, right? You're listening to them on the radio. Um, how do you think your fan experience is a little different than, say, 
a fan who may be a fan of a team which migrates to a different city today in 2022. So picture yourself as, as a fan in 2022, nine-year-old Paul, right? Do you think your fan experience would be the same or different? That's my first question. And I have a second question. It couldn't possibly be the same. I just think everything is so different. <clears throat> Such a universe is different. I would tend to think that a kid going through it now would, um, would not stick with the giants or that, that, that would happen more often. I mean, no way we can prove it, but, uh, Things are, I just think things are quicker, more ephemeral, and I, and, and it's not the same kind of loyalty. I don't think I could be wrong, but I'll just say, I know people who are against any of the changes in baseball. And I told a friend of mine, Dan Valenti, who wrote the intro, I don't want to be a scold. I don't want to be one of those old people. Let it change. Let it evolve. I don't, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a Victorian game in many respects. And, and maybe maybe it won't survive this generation, but I don't want to be one of those scolds. Thank you. Second quick question, if I may, really quick question. So much ink has been written and spilled about Willie Mays' impact on the game, right? So we're, I'm not going to ask you this question about that. As a fan, and you've been a fan of his your entire life, right? What, what, are, what is one or two of the biggest things that today's stars would be wise to remember about Willie Mays, right? What, what is an impact... Um, that you see as a fan, right? His lasting impact on the game that maybe we, we're, not, we're not necessarily thinking of every time we think of the, the name Willie Mays. Thank you. It's a good question. And the, the thing that first pops into my mind is have fun, have some fun. He was enjoying what he was doing. It was infectious. And, and forget about the you know, half a billion dollar contracts, go out there and have fun. So that, that's the first thought that comes to my mind. Thanks, Paul. Thank you for joining us, Jacob. Jacob, I might add something. Your question about how his fandom might be different. I think all of the people in here had to struggle so hard to yeah. follow the Giants as kids that that's why we are the way we are. And the people, you know... I, you know, Norm is from San Francisco and he says we're so knowledgeable here. It's because we had to be. Right. Today, right. If, if you become a fan, it, it's a piece of cake to follow a team. Right. Right. That's just my opinion. I'm sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's go to Renee and then Judge Jim. Oh, uh, Paul, thank you. That and was... Renee, you know, you, Renee, you know, you got to talk to Jacob about number 24 with the Mets. You know that. So go ahead. Absolutely. Oh yeah, I'll, thank you for bringing that up. Um, thank you for your uh, uh, for your stories, your memories. It kind of brings me back to m myself. Um, I, I, I was a late bloomer. My mom was a huge Giant fan, huge. I mean, it seemed like the moment I, 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 I had a baseball bat, she was telling me about Willie Mays, Monty Irvin, the Giants. And I gravitated to that as I got old. And for me, uh, 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 Jacob, um, as I got older, for me to follow Giants was the night out. Yeah. You know, the New York used to have three newspapers during the day, the Daily News, you know, the morning edition, the afternoon edition, and the, uh, the night owl edition. You know, when I was old enough, I would go to the newsstand looking for the night owl edition <laughs> or 1030 Sports Extra to find out what, what was the score of the game or if not, the next day. Anyway, um, the other thing what, with me it, going around uh, 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 what you mentioned, Paul, uh, I, I was very fortunate to be working at Madison Square Garden. I worked there when I was in college from 77 to 95. And like you, every time I went to work, I would be going to work, uh, you know, obviously early or, or, you know, I had to go down to the arena, get some information, but I would see athletes, uh, musicians, boxers in the elevator said nothing to them nothing like you who am i you know who am i would i doff my head uh, would i nod to them in acknowledgement mm -hmm. absolutely wouldn't say a word M maybe say hello uh years later uh uh, uh i was fortunate enough to join uh, a group that was uh uh that used to uh before this group and it was the new york giants preservation society 
and uh, they used to have society. historical society. Thank you. Wasn't it the nostalgia society? Mm, no, no, historical. Historically, it was. I mean, the president. I mean, we okay. had a lot of athletes come in, and one of them uh, was Willie Mays. He's coming in, and I got. I was fired up. I told my mom, "He's going to be there. I'm going to be there. I'm going to see him." And outside the Italian restaurant uh, uh, where we're going to have this, uh, I Borlini's. was work- What was the name? Borlini's restaurant. There you Lillard. go. He's got a good memory than better than me. But anyway, finally got in, was totally disappointed because at the end of the table, that's where usually the get, the guest of honor is. I was, in the, I was in the middle. So yeah. I was like, oh, man. All right. Well, at least, you know, and there was a, quite a lot of people there. To my stun, to, to, to my shock, he's sitting across from me in the middle. Yeah. I'm not going to I'm not going to lie to you. I got emotional. I got shaky. I was thinking about my mom telling me all this stuff. He tells his stories about the game. Everybody's loving it. He asks, well, let me hear about you guys. So my mom, my mom is still alive. She's 88. Mm -hmm. And I told him my mom is a huge fan of it. I said, oh, really? And then I told him a story uh, 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 about my mom. Um, And I tell, I told this group months, I mean, maybe last year about buying tickets at Manufacturers Hanover weeks before Mother's Day not even having a clue at the time that I bought the tickets that the trade would happen and he's showing up to New York. There it was. I, we go in and 24 is right up, right on the scoreboard lineup floored. He hits a home run. They went, I mean, it was, I'm telling him this story and the, you know what he says at the end of the, all this, he says, how's your mom doing now? Mm-hmm. I'm not going to lie. I covered my mm-hmm. face and I said, she's fine. And I, I wept. Mm-hmm. I wept because the fact that he said that, I'm crazy. Years later, I mean, you know, I even cried when it was Willie Mays night at Chase Stadium. He's saying goodbye. I didn't want, I didn't even go to my cousin's house. I went, no, I'm not going. I, tonight's game is going to be on TV. It's Willie Mays. I'm going to see it. Saw it, cried. Um, he, became, he was a coach for them for a while. Joan Payson was a huge fan of his and, you know, helped bring him back to New York, his home. Years had passed and never thought of it at the time, but they're retiring numbers. And I was like, what about Willie Mays? You know, I heard some stories, hey, he only played for, but then Hank Aaron played in the beginning of his career in Milwaukee, Atlanta Braves, and then Atlanta with the Braves, same team moving to Atlanta. And then he finished his last few years in Milwaukee. They retired his number, Milwaukee. So I've been like, what about Willie Mays? You know, I put some calls in. I mentioned some stuff. Haven't heard anything. That's, I mean, I, this should have been done years ago. Uh, so he would be aware of it. But that's been my, my passion to see this eventually happen. Hopefully it happens. But uh, uh, that's how much he means to me. So your stories, you know, I feel, I feel that passion that you had as a kid. And I still have it today. I get fired up when I hear this stuff. So. Thank you for your stories. Thank you very Thank you. much. Great well, story. Renee, that's how short-sighted the Mets are. Yeah. Well, that yeah. whole atrium, when you enter, it's all Dodgers, but that's, that's don't, all. Don't get I mean, me started with that. Yeah. Let, let's, <laughs> let's move on, because I got, I got issues. But let's another, move on. Uh, another fellow upstater, Judge Jim. Thank you, Gary. Um, my couple minutes with Willie, he came to Rochester. I'm thinking it was mid to late 70s, signed some autographs. I don't know if you can see this picture. But just my impression of him, just being a few feet away, uh, I'm surprised he was shorter than I, I, I expected. You expected mm-hmm. larger than life mm-hmm. guy. He's shorter than I expected, but powerful. Mm-hmm. I can still just remember his biceps, his forearms, and said, wow, this is a strong man. But uh, interesting, late 70s, go around doing autograph shows, and he came to Rochester and, of course, had to go chase him down and catch him and got a kind of nice autograph picture and a, and a photograph. But very powerful man. And I think you were mentioning how the good hitters were the strong guys, the farm mm-hmm. boys. And, uh, but he was bigger biceps and forearms than I anticipated. Mm-hmm. My daughter works in Rochester. Jim, you're right. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Where does she work? In Rochester. She li- lives in Honeyoy Falls. Ah, not too far. We're in yeah. Pantheon. All right. Anybody else before I give Harvey the probably last uh, question? 
Anybody who hasn't spoken? All right, Harvey, why don't you uh, take us home? Uh, a brief comment about today's fan. Uh, we have a nine-year-old grandson who is an avid fan, pretty good little ball player. He plays travel, plays little league. Now he happens to be Gary. Don't don't mute me out. He happens to be an avid Yankees fan. <laughs> and all right, I, hey, let's all give Paul a nice round. Of <laughs> <laughs> well, his name is James, uh, and his favorite on the Yankees, not surprisingly, is Aaron Judge. And when Willie celebrated his 90th birthday, Major League Baseball put together a video and they had a number of people wishing Willie happy birthday, including Aaron Judge. Judge grew up a Giants fan and he happily announced that he had a Willie Mays autographed baseball still in his old bedroom in his parents' home. So I happen to have, not surprisingly, a Willie Mays autographed baseball. And I gave it to our grandson, James. And I said to him, I explained to him who Willie Mays was. He understood that Aaron Judge had that ball. So I, even though he's a Yankees fan, that's the connection. Um, and I, I got to tell you, I think, I think there's a, there's a, a good strain of, of loyalty to a lot of things. By the way, he put, he put the Willie Mays autographed baseball, which I gave him, right next to a figurine of Jackie Robinson sliding into a base dressed in the Kansas City Monarchs uniform. Mm. Because I had that in our house for many years. I had made the uh, statement that no damn Dodger uniform was getting in my house. But it, it gave the opportunity to explain to the next generation and the next generation, what baseball meant. Jackie, he refers to it as his Jackie, and he's got his Willie ball. And it's a true story. Even though he's a Yankees fan, Gary, he's connected. <laughs> Thank you, Harvey. Paul, just fabulous tonight. Thank you so much for uh, doing this on a Wednesday. I think everybody really Thank enjoyed you. this. It's great yeah. fun. Thank Paul, you. again, Thank what's you. What's the best way to get the book? Really, the best way is to uh, type the title in on Amazon, um, Chasing Willie Mays, Paul Kosak. Uh, you can go straight to the publisher, but but uh, it's not going to be any faster or any cheaper. So um, I, I, this is a little like off topic, but I have to ask for an A. Were you in, in the elevator when uh, Bob Dylan did the 30th anniversary thing at Madison Square Garden? Wow, I've seen so many performers. It's like, it's muddled around. I mean, I, I might have. I, I can't say for sure. <laughs> Check it out on YouTube. It was, it was at Madison Square Garden. It was great. Okay, okay. Thank you, I will. Let's all uh, give it up for Paul Kosak. Thank you. Yay. All right, we will, uh, re I will send out the video once it's uh, done, hopefully tomorrow morning. Uh, in the meantime, we will reconvene in two weeks. And uh, I will hang around for a few minutes. I think I have to leave at 8.30 tonight, but I will hang around talking giant baseball for anybody who's interested. And again, Paul, thank you so much. You're the best. Be well. Oh, thank you. Appreciate thank it. You, Paul. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. I'm going to stop the recording.